Uh, we have a wonderful lineup tonight of women who are well-versed in a variety of aspects of working with entheogens and indigenous traditions and the insights and information that we gain in these experiences. Um, and first, uh, we're going to be welcoming Sarah Maiden. Sarah is a writer from San Francisco and Maui. Um, having studied ritual for many, many years and participated in ceremonies in numerous countries with various themes and entheogens and influenced by the 13 Grandmothers Council, she believes in the prophecies of this time in history. She feels that many are trying and few have proficient guides in this work. So she's going to uh, present some guidelines to help us with creating appropriate initiation rituals for wherever we are in our exploration of entheogens. And she believes that this, is, this presentation will be helpful and will offer some of the things she wished that she knew along the way um, before ceremonial initiation and uh, for support integrating these experiences on the other side. So let's welcome Sarah Maiden. Thank you. All right, great. So my name is Sarah Maiden, and um, I created this, uh, well, I published this paper in Reality Sandwich first. I wrote it while I was traveling in South America, um, and I was witnessing people try ayahuasca and San Pedro with experience or without any experience and come out of these rituals trying to integrate and not really understanding some of their experiences. I was also witnessing... Uh, really incredible shamans that didn't have all the, uh, didn't have a great understand of, understanding of Western psychology and culture. And so I started thinking, wow, we should really create a conversation for these people that are traveling to talk to each other about what it is they're experiencing and what ritual is, what it's used for, how it's appropriate or inappropriate, um, and what the energy of initiation can do and its characteristics. So really, I just wrote this paper, published it, turned it into a PowerPoint presentation, and started sharing it with people just to get them having an informal conversation about the subject of initiation. Um, and my background is, uh, let's see, I've had a lot of initiatory experiences in my personal life. Um, I've initiated in several times into a magical order. Um, I've had a boga with a 10th generation African shaman, um, Nino Santos, uh, mushrooms in Oaxaca, um, Wachuma, San Pedro in Peru, uh, ayahuasca ceremonies, um, Vision Quest. So I've had a lot of both psychedelic and non-psychedelic initiatory experiences, some of which were beautiful and elevating and some of which were difficult to integrate. So I speak from experience. <laughs> So I started just by looking up what is initiation and what's our definition in the West of initiation. And the Oxford English Dictionary says initiation is the act of admitting someone into a secret or obscure society or group. And I was disgruntled with this definition. Was like This is exactly what our dictionary would say. <laughs> um, in indigenous cultures or in the past, initiation has been a crucial part of the culture. And people are initiated from being boys to men and girls to women and come out of those initiations knowing who they are within their society and their tribe and knowing their place and vocation for the rest of their lives sometimes. Um, in the West we have a guidance counselor. <laughs> it really doesn't compare because there's no connection to the sacred from within. Um, so do P does anyone here want to share just a couple terms that they relate to initiation? Like descriptive terms for initiation? Yeah. Rites of passage, good. Anyone else? Transformation. Transformation. Commitment. Commitment, that's a really good one. Crossing the threshold. Crossing the threshold, yeah. That place where something breaks and changes. Hard work. Hard work can be. <laughs> Commitment. Commitment, again, that's a really good one. Hero's journey, definitely. Hero with thousand faces. Anyone else? Paradigm shift, really good one. So you really can be rewiring your program and changing the story. Anyone else? Contextualizing the self. Contextualizing the self. Great. Yeah, those are all good answers. And just, you know, get people thinking and talking about what this concept is because there is no one answer in a ritual setting. What this, you can't really pin it down. <laughs> um, 
but I came to, uh, yeah, initiation is either a specialized initiation ritual or any event in your life that changes, fundamentally changes your concept of self in relation to the world around you. It doesn't just have to be a uh, specialized ritual. Um, and then I have this quote from James Circio. He published an article in Reality Sandwich about initiation, and he talks about the lack of initiation in the West. He says, initiation is such a constant in the cultural body that is evident in one form or another in nearly every human culture that has ever existed before the industrial age, at which point it became notably absent, at least on the surface. This absence has produced a very real psychological crisis on a cultural scale. Although, as we will see in many ways, the initiatory impulse has merely transferred itself, oftentimes to behavior and beliefs which only shallowly fulfill this impulse. When societies lose their initiation practices, new ones emerge for rites of passage are hardwired in the psychological formula. Um, Excited. Uh, he talks about the risk of self-initiation because in, in James Hercio's article, he talks about uh, initiating himself basically with, with psychedelics, with uh, violence, you know, um, being a teenager in the suburbs, um, and the loss of control there, and the risk of doing that. Um, so the risk are lack of sac sacred witness, the alienation that can happen, or psychosis, opening big energies without having an understanding of those energies or a way to, uh, to move forward after opening them, um, or narcissism, ego inflation. The Western concept of surrendering control of the ego, insanity. The indigenous concept of surrendering control of the ego and connecting with everything, sanity. <laughs> um, I really came to this uh, through writing this, then publishing this article, as uh, so much of what that place is of breaking of, we, you could call it a psychotic break, the place you go to to change your fundamental idea of who you are and initiate into something else is, can be terrifying. And when that happens, you lose control, and your ego loses control. So who you think you are might just go away, <laughs> and, and then you have to emerge from that. So it can be terrifying, but the indigenous concept is that's, that's the home place when you're relating to everything around you and having a conversation with the world, and you let go. That's sanity. Initiation is sacred communion, separation versus integration, fear versus trust. One of my teachers used to always say, your suffering pushes you until your vision pulls you, which just relates to the concept of moving forward, uh, ritualizing the place where your wounds and challenges turn into your gifts, and that turns into what you're giving back to your community when you redefine yourself. Mm. I have a quote from Daniel Pinchbeck, published an article, also in Reality Sandwich, on a planetary initiation, where he says, as an analogy, we can look at the process of the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. In the chrysalis, the caterpillar doesn't just sprout wings. Its entire body melts down into a biotic goop. The code for the transmutation of the organism is held by a handful of imaginal cells that start to propagate in the as the caterpillar dissolves. Although attacked at first by the dying caterpillar's immune system, the imaginal cells install the program that produces the butterfly. Our modern civilization is now in the process of melting down and decomposing, and we have to become the imaginal cells engaged in this process of transmutation. So he just speaks to the individual uh, evolution affecting a greater consciousness one by one as planetary initiation. So then this is just a quick abstract of the paper. So I start with uh, some traits and guidelines for initiation and characteristics of initiation. Um, the first is just that initiatory energy can affect your psyche, past, present, and future. So it can affect your very first memories as well as your idea of yourself now and your future vision, vision which can be very confusing for a Westerner because it's not linear. Um, number two, Initiation well done affects all four worlds. Um, I like to refer to these because I study the tarot, um, but these are the four worlds of the Kabbalah. So the archetypal is the dream world, basically the world of visions. The creative is what you can create, art, writing, music. The formative is the mental, the intellect, and the material is this world. So if you go through a big initiatory uh, process, it's not uncommon to have a lot of synchronicities that affect every level of your being. And that can also be terrifying, but the truth is, it's affirming your process. 
So it's really about giving yourself time to integrate. Uh, another teacher of mine would always say, notice everything that happens 10 days before and 10 days after a big ceremony or a big initiatory event because everything is related to what you just shifted. Initiation can appear as extreme good or bad luck, which defies logic. Your initiation becomes a prayer in action, a living testament of your commitment to a new self-identity, which is alive and demanding. Um, this is important because a lot of people talk about, especially the shaman's path, when a shaman turns away from, from the inner calling to move in that direction, things can go wrong. But it's really true with anyone's path. And if you initiate and re-imprint to a new identity, it is your prayer in action to move forward with it. So it doesn't mean that as soon as you've uh, reconfigured that, everything in your life will be easy. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. It's a process. So it's a huge psychological shift to go through a psychedelic initiation or even a, just a ritualistic initiation. It takes time. Um, these two I got uh, from Jeremy Taylor, who is a dream work, a famous dream work psychologist. He published a book called what Water Runs Uphill and also the Dream Work Toolkit. Um, he talks about in dreams, uh, dreams are self-defining. No one else can define your dream for you. Uh, this also applies to any ritual setting or to initiation process. Uh, someone else can help you interpret your process, but really it's up to you to understand how it relates to your life. Um, there's also the aha moment, the moment of integration. And this can happen with any initiation or psychedelic process. Um, the aha moment is when you finally understand and embody the lesson that you've learned. This is one of my favorite quotes from Lon Myler Duquette. He's a famous ceremonial magician and tarot specialist. One does not learn a true magical secret like one learns a juicy piece of gossip. A true magical secret is a light bulb that goes off over your own head when you finally get something. So that speaks to this uh, embodied knowing that can happen when something shifts inside you. He says that you could expose every every secret of the universe to someone, but until they're in the place to receive and understand it, they won't hear it. So there are no secrets. Initiation is foremost the work of, uh, of the shadow, the psychological shadow, um, and embodying the shadow. The self-mastery or gnosis is the goal of initiation, so that they're the place in you learn your place in relation to serving the macrocosm. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Um, number 11 is initiatory work is all inclusive. There's no energy that can be demonized or polarized in the field. Um, this is true of any ritual setting, is that everything needs to come into the circle and, and nothing is wrong. This also relates back to Jeremy Taylor's rules about dream work. Um, everything that shows up in a ritual setting or an, especially in an initiatory setting where there's a huge energetic shift is related to the process. So there's no opposition. Um, set and setting, of course, is from Timothy Leary. Um, this is very important, especially when I was uh, traveling in Peru for people. They wander into a ceremony or you just find someone to do this life-changing psychedelic ceremony with and don't really take the time to think about what they're getting into. Um, the availability and depth of initiation is related to the individual state as well as the sacred container and the clarity of the initiators and the facilitators. Um, clear, it's important to clear the energy in a space to set a sacred container. It's important to decide on ritual structure and stick to it. You can have a tent to sleep in, but if you don't have any poles, you don't have anything. <laughs> so really it's about the chaos of the, the ceremony and the structure of the ritual coming together. That creates a much stronger setting. Uh, chaotic energy of initiation goes much farther with the grounding structure of ritual. Um, container is important because psychotic break is the territory of initiation, that place where things break. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, some people laughed. That's good. <laughs> it's good that you can laugh about that. <laughs> um, when you're re-imprinting and you're going to that basic level, archetypal level of yourself, you're going into a space that can be terrifying. So 
you want to look at the ritual you're walking into, the people that are setting the space for you, um, the safety of the container. And you want to think about that. You wouldn't trust your stranger with a bank account. Don't trust them with your soul either. So um, I think it's important to kind of check out the people that you're sitting with. Um, are they alcoholics? Do they have a decent reputation? You know, what's their background? Um, and this is important when you're traveling especially because there's lots of people out there that are just looking to make money. Oh, you have to ask yourself what you're aligning yourself with, basically. This is going to affect you for a long period of time. <laughs> mm. Number 14 is uh, energy can be used for healing or sorcery. So purity of heart and intention is the direction of your psyche. Um, it's simple but very profound. Um, in a world of matter and energy, intention is everything. So go in with a pure intention and hold on to it. It sounds very simple, but it's profound. Um, number 15, connect with source. Um, well, I have several stories that illustrate this, but in one um, place I was with a shaman, there were people that were just literally following every word that this man said, and they weren't even thinking for themselves anymore. <laughs> and he was a great teacher, but it, it was a little um, overboard. So I think it's really important, no matter where you are or who you're sitting with, to remember your own connection to source, that it's not about a teacher or a guru or the tools on the altar or this one way of connecting to the divine, that your connection to the divine is the most important thing, is the fundamental. And then look to those other things for tools. Uh, and I illustrate this by drop the form, engage the formless. Um, healing is available without endlessly repeating uh, grief or pain. I see that a lot in ceremony to people go through things over and over again and it's okay to come out of them. Um, but I also uh, added this one because there are, um, there are initiation rites and ceremonies and societies that initiate with violence um, and pain. And I don't believe it's necessary because we have so many other tools at hand now, um, entheogens and sweat lodges and ways to uh, imprint yourself onto healing rather than pain. Mm. Mm. Nothing can go wrong in a ritual setting. Everything is a part of it. Uh, this also relates back to Jeremy Taylor and dream work. Um, everything that comes into a ritual setting and into an initiatory setting is best interpreted as a symbol um, to integrate into the process. Um, this, is, this was really applicable in South America, especially um, forgiveness and healing rather than getting um, entrapped in ego battles. Um, evade this idea of attack through transportation, transmutation and gratitude, not counterattack. Um, but this also applies to your own thought process within a psychedelic field or a ritual field. As soon as something comes up in opposition to your ego, rather than trying to fight or suppress it, it's important to engage it. And this is it's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> in South America, there is a lot of talk of brujeria and of people being cursed or attacked by black magic, um, which I do believe happens, but uh, it's not useful to continue the the language of attack. It's more useful to enter into a space of transmutation and gratitude because a cat, the attack and counterattack just doesn't go anywhere. It never ends. Um, prayer as an ego demand versus request and surrender. Uh, I see prayer as a conversation with the universe, not a one-way channel. So it's not useful to just make demands. Um, and this just keeps coming back to uh, in a ritual setting or an initiatory state, it's more useful to surrender and have a conversation than have the constriction of your ego trying to control. And that's really the, the nugget that I got out of this conversation of how to deal with initiatory energies and uh, difficult ritual energies is to surrender the ego. Um, I also added here, 
when in doubt, when you're with heavy energies in a ritual setting, um, the easiest thing to do if you, if you do lose control in a frightening way is to connect with something outside of yourself, to the altar, to spiritual allies or teachers in the physical lineage or in the astral, or to spiritual practice. And that's really useful for people who are brand new to ceremony, but to everyone really. And it's easy to forget when you're in a difficult place. So after reviewing a lot of the information and talking to people, I defined initiation as an energetic shift that redefines the self with purpose in relation to your community and world, and it's accessible to everyone. So it's not so esoteric. It's, it can be mainstream and it is accessible. You can re-imprint yourself. Um, so I'll just finish with this. Today we have global unchecked environmental problems, violence, and an epidemic of psychological illness, the likes of which we, has never existed. If the depth of personal initiation, such as Illusion Mystery School or five-day near-death boga ceremonies, can reinvigorate an individual and teach them their proper identity in relation to the whole, how do we begin waking up the masses so that they may realize their potential and rebuild a collective relationship with personal power and responsible authority? Perhaps it is as it has always been. We rise one by one as the imaginal cells that awake to a greater consciousness begin to share the new vision. Let us learn again to initiate one another with pure intention, with experience and expertise and responsibility, added to the belief in the miraculous healing of psychological transformation and its ability to globally shift society by empowering individuals towards self-realization. Let us remember how to create heaven on earth, for that is the goal of gaining self-knowledge, to bring us collectively closer to the divine while living. So... That's pretty much the presentation. There's a little bio. Um, a lot of this artwork was from Jessica Perlstein, who's one of my favorite artists who's local to the Bay Area. And uh, there's some resources and works cited that are really good for understanding initiatory energies. Um, does anyone have questions or topics? Okay. And this entire paper is published on Reality Sandwich. Um, Initiation, Sarah made in reality sandwich. You can read the whole thing. I have a quick question um, about mm -hmm. insight and transformation. Um, I'm having this conversation as I'm working on my dissertation proposal, and it sounds like you kind of think that the aha moment is the integration of this, like you understand something now, and it's, and it's, you, know, so it's you get it, right? And I'm sort of having that, this conversation, like is insight like a transformational event? Is it something that can, sh does it have long-term value? Can you never, you know, it's like you can never unknow something, right? Once you heard something, you can never unknow it. So do you, what do you think about insight as far as like being sort of the core of transformation or the aha moment as you explain, maybe you could get into hmm. it a little bit more. Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> I think it could go both ways, really. I mean, according to a, a magical society, if you went through an initiation and you really embodied it, then I don't think you would forget it. But I don't think there's a one answer to that question. It would depend on the individual. Yeah. Go ahead. So... Uh, it there's a lot of um, before and after feeling to the initiation. Um, what happens when you feel like you've made the big shift and you're on the other side and, and you're now living into your new, your new paradigm or your new container, your, your, your true purpose to serve the world? Then does that imply that there's no more um, need for initiation ceremonies or... Like, it's just a, an endless unfolding? That's what I believe. It is an endless unfolding. You can be initiated far more than one time in your life. Yeah. Yeah, and you can, as much as there might be one time where you really uh, define your purpose for the long term, there's still more unfolding. Yeah, like layers to an onion. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. So then it, it'd be up to us to to choose what seems like it's in alignment with our personal development. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi. Oops, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I see there's a number of 
female authors here, and so much of the literature is male. Is, was there anything that stands out to you that you got from any of the your female ones? Like, there's a whole list there. Um, uh, most of them I I'm not familiar with. Yeah, um, I didn't really differentiate between the female and male authors. They're just different things I read and used as resources. Um, honestly, I've gotten a lot from uh, Ralph Metzner and Timothy Leary. I really like some of the writing of Timothy Leary because he talks a lot about um, being a cultural creative and having the ability to change the way you're thinking so that you can re-imprint yourself, which is fascinating in relation to the topic of initiation. Thank you so much. It was mm -hmm. fascinating. So many of the elders that I've spoken with mention the importance of ha being welcomed back into community as part of initiation, that too often we're striving for knowledge or power in its individual ego path. So if you could speak to that, um, that the individual is actually going through this for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so much of what I came to as my personal definition of initiation had to do with um, identifying the self in relation to the whole and how you can be of service, really. Um, I was reading a book about boys in an African tribe that go through an initiation ceremony and they, they come out with a vision of knowing their role in the tribe from that point on and how, how they are of service. I think a lot of Westerners often travel places really far away and learn things and come home. It's, it's a little bit like the hero's journey, but then they're not witnessed within their community. And I think that is a tricky uh, thing to navigate because having that sacred witness within your own community and have, being known, having your uh, process, your transformation known and supported is really important. So yeah, it goes both ways. I think it's an important point. Uh, because you've had experience with various entheogens such as iboga and ayahuasca, do you have? Uh, did you see any advantage between, let's say, ayahuasca and iboga in, t iboga in terms of um, the kind of healing uh, that? One emphasizes more physical healing or an emotional healing. Would the, did the two differ that way at all? I don't think so. Um, in my opinion, they're both um, they're both conscious entities, <laughs> and so they can affect you on every level. In the West, we think of a boga as a substance for treating addiction, but that wasn't my experience. Um, a boga doesn't just treat the physical; it's a magical ally. It treats every level. I have a question. Um, first, I, I really enjoy what you're talking about, and I think it really needs to be talked about. <clears throat> and I was wondering how you think we're doing in terms of developing our own uh, ceremonial uh, situations and initiatory practices that are our own homegrown for our culture. How do you see that happening? Yeah, that's really tricky. I because I've traveled a lot, I've been in ceremonies in different places in the world, and those aren't necessarily appropriate in the West or in East Tennessee or Kentucky. <laughs> you know, it's not a part of the culture. Um, there are different groups that are creating rituals. Um, I know one group in Washington that does uh, women's initiation uh, rituals with hiking with like troubled youth, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, but as a whole in uh, mainstream American society, I think it's still really an issue and it's something to address because it, I, I addressed at the beginning of the, of the speech um, that James, James Circio wrote a whole article in Reality Sandwich about the lack of initiation and growing up in the suburbs and these children, you know, just, just lashing out in different forms, really looking for a way to rewire their own consciousness and, and define themselves. Um, and I think that's one of the risks to not having initiation within society. So. It's something we could really work on. Yeah, it's important. Hi, I was hoping you could speak more to the appropriateness or inappropriateness of initiation. Um, one question that comes up for me is that a lot of these medicines or allies 
come from very specific places, cultures, and ecosystems. And there are plenty of shamans here, for instance, that brew their own ayahuasca. And um, I certainly have the question of whether it makes sense to take something like that out of its context. Mm -hmm. I think that's really up to the individual. But I, I can also say that uh, ritual and initiation doesn't require psychedelics or any kind of, of entheogen. And, and there are extremely powerful initiations that have no psychedelic substances involved that are, will affect you just as much. Um, so that's my personal answer. <laughs> but it's something to think about, sure. Um, I'm wondering like, how you would um, like, describe or open a conversation about initiation to somebody who doesn't, isn't familiar with spiritual lingo and all the, little, like, all the mm -hmm. words that we've been studying, uh, but to someone who's very like, aware and spiritual without that lingo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that can be really difficult. Um, I think part of what initiation has done for me in my life or my personal initiations has broken my conditioning. So I, I really was, uh, I grew up in a very conformed, conditioned family and society. So I didn't even believe certain things were accessible. So the language that I use now, I probably wouldn't have understood then. And I wouldn't have believed in it. It sounds magical. <laughs> so it's, uh, hard to, it's a hard subject to address. It's um, a good question. Does anyone else have an answer? <laughs> graduating from high school and college, getting your degree. Yeah, that's good. I, yeah, I had people in Peru when we had this conversation talk about their pregnancy as initiation um, and childbirth because it changed them biologically, like emotionally, it changed their role in society completely. So it really is an initiation, right? The woman's cycle. Mm, yeah, the menstrual cycle definitely is. Um, so in continuation of what you've said, like when a, the hero goes, travels afar and comes back and like there's a community, but there's no community for that person. Um, how, how would they have that community? Like that person find the community? Well, I think in the idea of the hero's journey, if you do travel afar and come back with something and you're really empowered with it, then you become the person that creates that trans that uh, that conversation for others and you become the one that lead them into those understandings because you've got that kernel of understanding to share with other people so it, it it's up to you at that point thank you very much sarah appreciate mm -hmm. it thank you everyone mm -hmm. thank you